Hello, everyone, and welcome to week three at Grantham University Physics 220. This week, we start by looking at circular motion. So this is an object that is moving in a circular path, many times with a constant speed. Note that even though the object may be moving with a constant speed, it is not moving with a constant velocity as its direction is constantly changing. And remember back to Newton's first law, that means then there will be an acceleration uh, and also a force acting on it. So this acceleration is called centripetal acceleration and is given by V squared over R. And then using F equals MA, the centripetal force is given by MV squared over R. Also, we see there is a big connection to gravity, and then this can even tie into how we determine orbits and orbital dynamics. So at this point, I want to review force and mass and how they are a little bit different. Remember, we saw that mass is the amount of matter in an object, and weight is the gravitational pull in the object. The big key this week is that we focus on Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation, again, that we saw last week. The general form of this equation is F equals G M1 M2 over R squared, where G is the gravitational constant we see below. M1 and M2 are the masses involved, and R is the distance between the objects. Uh, G, again, has a value of 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meter squared per kilogram squared. By the way, those units just become from looking at the graph of force versus the product of mass over distance, and that's the slope. This is important for a few reasons, the most important being that it is the same everywhere in the universe. This is one of the biggest parts of his law of gravitation was the word universal, um, meaning that the same laws work here on the Earth as they do in space, and then we can do things like calculate the orbits of the moon or planets or other objects in space. Another thing of interest there is the fact that it is the first example of what's called an action at a distance force. Basically, he was able to prove that two objects nowhere near each other and not touching each other unlike other examples of a, someone pushing on a door or, or a horse pulling a car or something like that. But his law of gravitation says these two objects nowhere near each other they actually exert a force on each other. We'll see examples of this in later classes with electrostatics and electromagnetism. So next we move on to work, energy, and power for this week. The nice thing about working with energy, power, and work is that they are scalars, not vectors. Even though they are related to the forces, and then also the displacement, and then we'll also see the masses, since they are scalars, they're usually much easier to work with. You can solve problems a lot quicker, and also you have other quantities you have to work with. So work is defined as a force times a distance, or the distance over which you apply the force on the object is the work done on the object. And the units are newton meters or joules, meaning one joule is one newton meter. Also, if the force is being applied at an angle, imagine if you're pulling a box on a rope and you're not pulling directly straight in line, only the component of the force in the direction of motion does work, or the force times distance is Fd cosine theta, where theta is the angle between the direction of the force and the direction of motion. Plus, work is path independent if it is conservative. This means the total displacement matters, not the path taken. For example, you can walk around in a spiral staircase, or you could walk straight up on a ladder. The total work done is the same. Now, conservative work is one when there is not a loss of work to the environment, usually things like air resistance or friction. Non-conservative work is where there is a loss. Again, things like friction or air resistance slowing that system down. So before we move on to kinetic energy, let's look at a work energy and power example. So it's a multi-step problem, so I want to go through each um, part of the question pretty straightforward. So a 330-kilogram piano slides 3.6 meters down a 28-degree incline and is kept from accelerating by a man who is pushing back on it parallel to the incline. Uh, there's a figure in the book that will actually show this, 6-36. Uh, Calculate, uh, uh, sorry, the effective coefficient of friction is 0.4. Calculate A, the force exerted by the man, B, the net work done by the man, C, the work done by the friction force, D, the net work done by the force gravity, and last but not least, E, the net work done on the piano. So what we're going to see we're going to have to do is we're going to have to approach each problem sequentially, um, break down the forces of the piano into its x and y direction, and then calculate the various steps as we work through this. So now we start with part one, the force exerted by the man. 
So the sum of the forces in the y direction is the normal force on the piano minus the component of the piano's weight in that direction. So this gives us that the normal force is mg cosine theta. Now, the more interesting part, the sum of the forces on the piano in the y direction are mg sine theta, the weight of the piano in the y direction, minus the force from the person, minus the force of friction, and this is also equal to zero. So this gives the force the person has to exert is the weight of the piano minus the frictional force. Now, we saw from the previous one that the normal force is mg cosine theta, and the frictional force is just mu times the normal force. So in this case, it's going to be mu sub k mg cosine theta. So if we factor that out, we get that the force the person has to apply is mg sine theta minus mu k cosine theta. Plugging in our numbers, the piano member is 330 kilograms. G is 9.8 meters per second squared. Then we have sine of 28 degrees minus 0.4, that's the mu, times the cosine of 28 degrees is going to give 3.8 times 10 to the 2 newtons. Now the work done by the man is the work done by the p vector. The angle between the p vector and the motion is 180 degrees. So looking at our numbers here, the work then is going to be the force from the first part, the 3.8 times 10 to the 2 newtons, times the distance, which is 3.6 meters, times a cosine of 180 degrees. So the cosine of 180 degrees gives us a negative 1 immediately. So then we see that then it's just 380 newtons times 3.6 meters, so it gets a value of negative 1.4 times 10 to 3 joules. Now, the angle between the FP and the motion is 28 degrees. So for calculating the next part, which is the work of friction, we see that the work of friction is force of friction times the distance traveled times the cosine of 180 degrees. So this is going to be the mu k, the normal force, which is the mg d cosine theta. Okay, so that ends up being, again, um, negative 0.4 because it's, it's going in the opposite direction. The 330 kilograms times the 9.8 meters per second times the 3.6 meters, again, times the cosine of 28 degrees. And we see that the friction does negative 4.1 times 10 to the 3 joules. So now the angle between the force of gravity and the direction of motion is 62 degrees in this case. So the work done by gravity is, the work of gravity is Fg d cosine 62, or mg d cosine 62. So again, it's 330 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times the cosine is 62. And we see the gravity is doing 5.58 times 10 to 3 joules worth of work here. Now, since the piano is unaccelerated, and the net force on the piano is zero, and the net work done on the piano also has to be zero. And we can see we get this by adding the three works together, meaning the negative 1,400 joules minus the 4,100 joules plus the 5,500 joules, again, should sum to zero. And in our situation here, as you would imagine, since there is actually no net displacement, as um, it's, it's going down with a constant... Um, the speed and whatnot that the total work done in this situation is going to add to zero. So I hope this is a nice multi-port example that helps clarify one of the very common problems that you're going to come across in a physics class. So we started to talk about work energy and power, and we want to look at the different types of energy involved. Work, as it turns out, is the mechanical transfer of energy. So now we want to examine the energy of motion, or what we call kinetic energy. Mathematically, the formula is given as one-half mv squared. Notice it depends only on the physical attributes, mass and velocity, and only has a value when the object is moving. So the kinetic energy of any stationary object is zero. Also, notice it's proportional to the square of the velocity, not just the velocity. So, for example, a car accident at 100 miles per hour is 100 times more dangerous than one at 10 miles per hour because it has 100 times the kinetic energy. This is why it takes more energy to make objects go faster and faster. Also, like work, the units here are joules. Next up, we have potential energy. As the name states, this is basically stored energy. Now, unlike kinetic, there are many different types. 
There are gravitational, spring, chemical, electrostatic, or magnetic, just to name a few. So let's look at a work example and see how this connects to a certain type of energy. Think of a mass m lifted a height h, so that the work done is the force times the distance. Now we see that the first thing here, the force, is just the weight, or mg. So the total work done is mgh, and this is called the stored energy, or the ability to do work, so this is then the gravitational potential energy, or PE equals mgh. Notice that this does not depend on this velocity, but it does have a zero point, as all potentials do. In this case, we chose it as a ground. Also notice again here, like work and kinetic energy, that the units are joules. So far we've talked about work, kinetic energy, and potential energy. And now we have a new quantity that we call the total energy, and we define it as such that it is the sum of the kinetic and the potential. The key thing is that for conservative forces, the total energy is always conserved. Again, it would have units of joules, just like work and energy. Looking at this, this makes solving many problems much easier with energy rather than just kinematics, like I mentioned earlier. So, what I'd like to do now is show you an example that proves this. Say we have an object of mass m that is 10 meters above the ground. If we drop it, how fast is it going the instant before it hits the ground? Now, we could solve this using our kinematic equations, but it takes a little while longer. So, what we'll do is look at this in terms of energies. And remember, the total energy is kinetic plus potential, or 1 half mv squared plus mgh. So in the beginning, there's all potential, no kinetic. It's not moving, there's no velocity, there's no kinetic. So the potential energy initial is mgh. At the bottom, there's no potential since we are basically at h0. And by the way, at the bottom, I mean the instant before it hits the ground, not once it stopped moving. And since there's no potential, then it has to be all kinetic. So the final kinetic energy is 1 half mv final squared. Now by the conservation of energy, we can set these two equal to each other, or mgh equals 1 half mv squared. And remember, we're trying to solve for V final. So, now to solve for this, first thing notice is the mass cancels out and it's not even needed. That's why it was never given, and it doesn't matter what it is. So, then we have 2GH, because I multiplied both sides by 2, equals VF squared. Now, square rooting both sides, we get V final equals the square root 2GH. Or, when we plug in our value of 10 meters and the value for G, we get 14 meters per second. The really cool thing about this is it works for any object falling a height h. So you could be 150 meters in the air, and you may just want to know what its velocity is at 25. All you have to do is put in 25 meters and extend it, so on and so forth. So this is a great example of how we can see that using the principles of conservation of energy, we got a result with just a few steps and a little bit of algebra that would have taken much, much longer if we used our kinematic equations. Finally this week, we get to the concept of power. Power measures the rate, or how fast or slow, one uses energy. So it's defined as the work used divided by time, or the units are joules per second, or what we commonly know as a watt. So a common example I have here is, to remember when you're looking at power bill that you get from your electric company, is that you do not pay for power, but energy. This is good, otherwise you bill for how much and how fast you use energy. An example I always like to use here are two things I have in my house. One is a nightlight and one is a bass amplifier. And I use these because they match up pretty good. My son's nightlight is a 4 watt bulb, which means it pulls 4 joules of energy every second at its maximum. Now my bass amplifier has a power rating of 400 watts, meaning it pulls 400 watts of energy, 400 joules of energy, excuse me, per second. Now, the important thing is it costs me the same amount of energy, and thus money, if I have my son's nightlight on at 4 watts for 100 seconds, or if I have my amplifier on for 1 second. The point is you're paying for the energy, not the power, which is the energy and how fast you use it. Well, that concludes week 3. Remember, if you have any questions, you can always email your professor at any time for clarification.